Welcome to Public Forum, a community outreach program produced by North Idaho College located on Lake Coeur d'Alene. Featuring guests from around the globe addressing a wide variety of subjects, Public Forum serves to educate and enlighten. Please join host and moderator, political scientist Tony Stewart, in welcoming today's guests. We're very pleased to welcome you to today's program, and we're very honored to have as our guest Donald R. Burgett, who is a World War II veteran, and he served in that war with great distinction. He was a member of the 2nd Squad of the 2nd Platoon, Company A, of the 1st Battalion of the 506th Parachute Infantry Regiment. Our guest uh, has authored four books. Uh, one is just now coming out about his experience uh, in that uh, very major war to defend freedom. He fought at the Operation Market Garden, which was the subject of a movie, A Bridge Too Far, and he was also involved with the invasion of Normandy and the Battle of the Bulge. Uh, we're so pleased to have you. We're honored to have you here today to talk about uh, this very, very important time in our history, and we look forward to uh, your responding to our questions, Mr. Burgett. Well, thank you very much. It's, it's really an honor to be here. Well, thank you yes. so much, and I want to take time to say we want to be uh, very appreciative of the fact that the Coeur d'Alene Cultural Center has brought you to our city and this program. We thank them very much. Our panelists, as always, are Janelle Burke, who's an attorney in the state of Idaho, and next to her is Steve Schink, who is the Vice President of College Relations and Development with Idaho College, and I shall ask Janelle to commence today's <coughs> questioning. It's an honor to have you here. And it's always so very interesting to talk to people who have personally lived a part of history. Can you tell us how old you were when you went, uh, when you enlisted? I, I assume you enlisted. Uh, how old were you, and, and what caused you to get involved? I think uh, after Pearl Harbor, most all the Americans wanted to be involved. It was uh, something that was an atrocity against the American people and against America, and all the young men and women volunteered. And uh, that's when I wanted to go in, but I was too young, and I had to wait till I was 18. But on my 18th birthday, I, vo I did volunteer, and I went in. Where did you go in at? Where, where uh, I was you? in Michigan. You were in Michigan. Mm -hmm. And then were you assigned right away, or did you go to boot camp? No, I, was, uh, I, I joined the paratroopers, and that's an, an all-volunteer organization. It is to this day. Uh, they have never drafted a person into the paratroopers. And I went in, uh, my older brother had gone into paratroopers and that gave me the lead and uh, they just, they were just uh, started in this country in September of 42 and so he went in right immediately and then I went in uh, in May, May 11th of 43. Mr. Burger, can you kind of quickly take us through the major uh, steps you you followed, uh, the, the major engagements and battles you fought in throughout that part of your service in World War II? Well, after uh, training and becoming a, a paratrooper, qualified paratrooper, uh, we were sent to England as replacements from the 541 Regiment, and uh, entered, I, that's when I joined the 101st Airborne. Mm -hmm. Very famous unit? Yes. And I, I went, uh, then we went to, um, uh, further training, night uh, practice for the uh, Normandy invasion. So we made night jumps. And gasoline was still rationed even to the military, believe it or not. And sometimes we could get the planes, we couldn't get the fuel. But when we got the fuel, we couldn't get the planes. And so at times they took us out at night on trucks and jumped us off the tailgates across the English countryside. But in, uh, once we became oriented to what we was going to do, we uh, went into Normandy. And we led the Normandy invasion. You know, I parachuted in at 14 minutes after 1 in the morning when the point of, of the lead. And um, the beach invasion came in five and a half hours later after we did. And Let um, me just stop you right there for sure. a quick second, if I may. That was the first real action you saw in the war was, was the invasion of Normandy? Pretty, pretty yes historic. and no. Uh, when, during a practice jump, we were, uh, it was a night jump, we ran into a German bomber formation oh. that was bombing England and the English were shooting us down as well as the German bombers. So, uh, you know, if you want to say I was in action at that time, yes, I was. And when you're getting shot down, you're in action. Certainly. Thank you very much. Sure. Well, we went into um, <clears throat> Normandy and uh, we fought through there. We liberated, uh, my group, there was 26 of us got together and we liberated the first town that was liberated in Europe. It was uh, Ravanaville. 
and uh, St. Mary of Gleese was liberated by the 82nd Airborne uh, later on that evening, and that was the first major city. But we, we also took part in the only ordered bayonet attack made in Europe in World War II by the Allies. I was wounded twice in that battle, that, that bayonet attack. And uh, then after Normandy, <coughs> now Montgomery had uh, grand plans for uh, going through uh, across the Rhine at Arnhem and swinging in through the Ruhr Valley. His plan was actually to uh, take the Ruhr Valley, which would be, was the true heart of, of uh, Germany, and go on into Berlin and end the war within two weeks. But we went in there. We were in behind the lines for 72 days, and that uh, particular operation was a total failure. We were out of Holland for uh, three weeks when the Battle of the Bulge erupted. We didn't have ammunition. We didn't have full complement of men or replacements, and uh, we had uh, didn't have proper uniforms. And they put us aboard 380 open cattle trucks in the middle of winter and drove us up to uh, Bastogne. And the drivers would not go into all the way into Bastogne, so we had to de-truck in a little town called Champs. We walked three miles into Bastogne, and we turned north, went five miles to Noville. And at that same time, General uh, Piper was coming in with the entire German SS 5th Panzer Division. And we hit them head on. And we had no overcoats, no overshoes, no gloves, not enough ammunition. One of the men in my squad actually had a stick. He kept hitting it against the road and said, I'll have a rifle tonight. That's the way we went into combat. And um, anyway, after uh, we were um, held Bastogne for nine, eight days, then Patton broke through. He was shunted from the Siegfried line and came up, broke through to us. And we thought we had earned a rest by this time because my one division, the 101st Airborne Division, held off nine German divisions when we were completely surrounded. And uh, they call us the hole in the donut. And when the Germans demanded our surrender, McCullough told them nuts. He said, we're, we're beating your wild butt, if you want to say it, and you know it. So anyway, we, uh, we uh, once Patton got through, we were issued ammunition, weapons, and a few replacements, and we went into an uh, additional attack for tw uh, 22 continuous days and nights, and uh, beat up as we were. And then after that, we thought we would de still deserve to rest, but they, there was another breakthrough called Operation Nordwind, which came up through Alsace. So we were shunted over there as shock troops, and we helped with that deter that one. And then from then on, uh, Patton had uh, finally reached the Ruhr Valley, and that had to fall. So we were special forces, and so we were shunted up there. And uh, we helped with the destruction of the Ruhr Valley. And then from then on, it was dominoes in reverse. Germany was collapsing, and it was a race to see who could be the first into Berchtesgaden, and Hitler's home. Thank you very much. Sure. I'd like to pick up on that story when you Got, you were involved with the couch of Hitler's home at the uh, Bercher Garden. Uh, tell us about that experience. And are, were you aware that you were coming to his uh, his home? Oh yes, yes, we knew it. Uh, but the Germans who were retreating were blowing the bridges behind him, and uh, we finally found one bridge that was still open. And we were supposed to, uh, under orders by General Eisenhower, uh, since we had proved ourselves throughout. Holland, Normandy, uh, uh, the other battles that we were in, he wanted the, my outfit to have the honor of being the first into Hitler's home. So he gave that directive. There was one general, I don't want to name him right now, but he, um, he wanted to be first, have his name, politics. So he, we were paratroopers, we had rifles, he had tanks, half tracks, so he blocked the only, sent one platoon across, motorized, told them that when they got into Berchtesgaden, give him a radio call, and he blocked the only bridge there by tanks and trucks. And once he received the radio call, he opened up the bridge, and we went across. And, and so actually, we, were, we weren't even second, because the French by this time, under General uh, was it Leclerc, had come around from the other way through uh, Bad Reichenhall. And so the, the generals. Third division entered first. Uh, the French, Free French, entered second, and we 
who were appointed to do this thing. We came in third, but um, we had, the rest of them moved on by order, and we were there. But there was that's that's when we took Hitler's home. Eagles don't even stop during wartime, do they? <laughs> <laughs> Everything is, ends up to be in politics, you know. Yes. One other question before I go back to the panel. Uh, you and others like yourself are to be so honored because certainly in the recorded history of the United States, this is the greatest threat to our survival and to our democratic process. And without what you did, we wouldn't be sitting here today with free speech and, and democratic principles. Uh, based on that, you all sacrificed a lot, and I know you lost a lot of friends. And I want to be sensitive, but would you share with our audience uh, some um, examples of how difficult this was. I'm sure you lost friends during the battles. And yes. uh, I don't know really how to ask the question other than to say, uh, again, with sensitivity, but how it must feel to be in, in such a, a life struggle, knowing that the enemy is very powerful also. Well, I think when a young man goes into combat the first time, the reason he joins is to be patriotic and he goes in with a flag in one hand and a pistol in the other hand to do battle. But once you get fired on the first time, you're fighting for survival. And it's a self thing. It's a God-given instinct that you have to survive. We still accomplished our mission, but you're still trying to survive. And that was, um, it's kind of a two-way battle trying to accomplish your mission when you have to get up and run into a face into a, a firing machine gun. I've had three bullet holes shot through my pants leg. I've had my chin strap shot off. And you have to keep running into them, and yet you want to live. And I've seen my buddies killed, as you mentioned. When the war ended, out of approximately an average, uh, the companies fluctuated from 190 to over 200 depending on the situation, and, uh, and out of my 190 men average, when the war ended, there was only 11 of us left that had gone through the whole thing. I'm one of the 11, and most of the 11 are now dead today. So it's been very, very personal to you. Yes, Before I go back personal. to Janelle, we don't have time to go into them. I wish we did, but I do want our viewers to know that they can, they're getting only a very, very brief description on our program, but they could certainly read your books. Would you take just enough time to identify your three books? I have them here with me today. Uh, here's the first one, if you would. Uh, that is uh, Kurahi, and that is a battle cry of the 506 Parachute Regiment, and it means stand alone. It's mm -hmm. from a mountain in Georgia. That's, uh, that tells about Normandy. And the second book I have with me, Seven Roads to Hell. Uh, again, I want to see what it looks like. Well, Chronologically, that's the third one. Okay, let me. Well, that's, no, that's all right. Okay, we'll let's go, go with, with that, that one. one. Okay. Uh, seven Roads to Hell was uh, when we were ordered to take and hold Bastogne, and it had seven roads running through it like the spokes of a wagon wheel, and the Germans needed that, and we had to keep them from getting it. And then the the, uh, the third one I have here, but not in that order of location. Right. That's uh, that's when we, after Normandy we parachuted into uh, our, um, Holland, and the British went into Arnhem. And we fought our way up to there, to the Arnhem, but then they, um, most of them perished in, Ar in Arnhem. It was a failure. And uh, these are at different bookstores, I'm sure, but yes. are they all by the same publisher? Uh, yes. Okay. They're by Presidio, uh, Presidio Press, and they're in Novato, uh, uh, California, right across okay. from uh, Frisco. And finally, you have a fourth book coming out. I have a fourth book. I'm in the process of just finishing up on the editing. I'm supposed to be there editing now instead of being here. Well, thank you for <laughs> taking time. But anyway, time. it's going to be out August 14th. And it's going to be titled? Uh, Beyond the Rhine. Thank you very much, Janelle. There are so many questions one would like to ask when we get a chance to talk to someone like you who have, actu who have actually been there. Um, it's a time, I'm sure, where, that you look back on and you form many friendships, and they were very close friendships, and there's a bond there that probably no one else can understand. Can you describe that in some detail? And also, can you tell us something about leadership? Were there some people who were just born to be leaders and who were there and you looked up to them? Um, what made leadership? Well, yes, the, uh, uh, let's see, the first question, I think the first part of the question was about the bonding. Yes, yes we had um, a brutal training to where only a paratrooper would stand alone behind the lines. 
And uh, we, since we were all that way, we trusted each other. We, if we were back to back and there was two men and 50 enemy, we would, uh, we, one would not let the other one down. So we trusted each other even probably more so than our own brother, but because of what we were going through. And um, so there became a, a very strong bond and when someone was killed, uh, we felt it very strong. We didn't show it a lot of times, and, but we, we felt it. I see, still feel it very strongly, especially with Spear, very good friend of mine. And um, the other part of the question is uh, the leadership. Uh, there, I think Patton said it the best, and I don't like it. Um, he said there are officers and there are men, and never the two shall meet, and he meant it. And the officers, when they, they never made a request, every time they said something, it was an order. And, but it had to be that way. Uh, you could not hold a, a conference to say, well, the order to ban a, attack, shall we go or will we not? And they, they um, you have to give an order and it has to be responded to now, immediately, without question. And so there has to be that quality. And yes, there are natural born leaders. Were the leaders among your group, not necessarily officers, but leaders among your group? Yes. At one time, we lost uh, nearly all of our officers. I think we had two officers left and a shelling, heavy shelling by 88s. And immediately, there are, are privates who will step in, and uh, they know who is qualified. We know who is qualified. We don't even question them. You know, like, in other words, if a uh, veteran stepped in and said, okay, I'll take over the company, fine. We, there was no, no, no question about it. So. Uh, Vetlin, Red Knight, um, Slick Hohenscheidt, there's a few of them that always step forward first, and uh, they were qualified, and we, we uh, since we were so close in training, we knew it, and so the privates a lot of times took over squads, platoons, companies, you know, that, uh, and they, uh, some of them did receive battlefield com uh, commissions after that, too. You see. Uh, Mr. Burgett, this is a personal pleasure for me to meet you and do this show, because as I told you, was when we talked before the taping mm -hmm. started, that uh, my father was at the Battle of the Bulge too, and I was very curious. Uh, the first thing you mentioned about that was your lack of supplies and equipment, right. and, you know, food, clothing, and, and that's what my dad would talk about when he rarely talked about the war. He talked about being cold, being hungry, being wet. Why is that from a soldier's point of view? Why is that the memory that seems to come up? Or is that the memory you talk to people who weren't there about? Mostly, <clears throat> excuse me, mostly it's the what you talk to people about who weren't there. Uh, a lot of my buddies uh, to this day will not tell anyone. Uh, uh, if he wasn't a combat man, they don't even want to talk to him. Mm -hmm. Because a lot of times I, I have, when I first got home, I have had some people ask me questions and uh, about the battles, and I would tell them as you know, uh, candidly and as honestly as I could, and as I walked away, I'd hear them say they thought I was out of earshot. Well, he's a liar. That couldn't happen, but it did happen. And um, so the combat men, especially your paratroopers, don't want to talk to anyone, and a lot of them won't talk to anyone but another paratrooper. And uh, so the only time that you can really get to the people who weren't in combat was something they can relate to. Have you ever been cold? Yeah, everybody's been cold, unless you were born and raised in Florida, you know, but and never left. But <laughs> But anyway, yes, uh, so you tell them, yes, we were cold, we were hungry, we were without, without clothing, we were out without supplies, and that's what they relate to, and you don't, you don't get um, referred to as a liar at times. I, I understand a little better now, thank mm -hmm. you. Uh, another question, it, <coughs> it, the, uh, the war in Europe ended 56 years ago, roughly, right. a little more than that now, and yet it is still a, a story that um, is being told and that people are very eager to hear. Saving Private Ryan came out only recently. Right. Um, you've got a new book coming out, and, and I appreciate that. It gets me back in touch with that period. Why, uh, this might sound like a silly question, but why do you think there is still so much interest in those events? I think there's so much interest because the World War II was the greatest war in the history of this world, period. And uh, out of that war, the greatest battle, land battle, was the Battle of the Bulge. The, the, the Battle of the Bulge covered more square miles than did the Battle of Stalingrad and involved more peace, people, personnel, uh, enemy and, and uh, allies and civilian and uh, equipment than did the Battle of Stalingrad. Uh, the, the ba and it was the most 
I think outside of uh, Normandy, it was the most pivotal battle of World War II. And people are just now becoming to uh, realizing the, the scope of World War II. And so they're, they are interested in what, what happened all these many years ago, you know, the battles that we had. Uh, and the way I tell some people, it was, they ask, what is a world war? What do you mean by world war? And I said, and it's kind of brutal, but I said, it's a world war, it's legal to kill somebody any place in the world. If I have an enemy, I can probably kill him in China, Japan, Germany, Norway, or wherever, and I would get a medal for it if necessary, but it was legal to kill somebody. And that's, it's wrong, it's, but it's war, and yeah. that's, that's the scope of it. If Tony will let me have one more quick question, sure. and this may be unfair because you're writing about your personal experiences. I don't think you've claimed to be a, a, a historian or an expert on the war no, in total, but that scope was a word I was about to use. If you can, would you share with us a little bit more about the scope of the Second World War? Um, do you know any of the number, the numbers of, of uh, military casualties and civilian casualties, things like that <clears> that might give the audience? Well, let's put it this way. I don't know the exact figures of the deaths. I think the United States had around 500,000 killed. But the, um, there was uh, 16, approximately 16 million people in the military service in America, 16 million. But then what, what people don't realize, out of the 16 million, less than 1 million did all the fighting in Europe and the Pacific. Mm -hmm. it was, there was 15, for every man in a foxhole could take the slack out of a trigger, take a bead and pull it, touch it off. There was 15 men behind him who never heard a shot fired in anger because they were truck drivers, dock workers, people in hospitals, food handlers, and so on, and people bringing ammunition up. But the one man, it was 15 to one. Today it's 23 to one. And uh, so the, the scope of that, uh, after World War II, I, I don't know how they came about the figures, but there was an excess of 40 million people died as a direct war uh, result of World War II. That's a lot of people, 40 million. Cataclysmic event. That tells you why One we're war. still talking and writing about it. Right. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. And I assume, in addition to that 40 million that died, that the others continued to die later from uh, complications and yes. things have happened since. Yes. My brother died too. He lost his leg. His leg was blown off and he died some years later. Not as a, yeah, I guess you could say it was a direct result of the, the wound, but it was, uh, they had to keep him on drugs for so long and um, the drugs finally killed him. Mm -hmm. My question, uh, my final question, we're fairly short on time and Janelle will have another round at least. Uh, when you liberated, and I think that's an important word to say. That is very important. Uh, Germany, and then later, of course, it was Japan with others involved there, and Italy, and so forth, to again have a victory for democracy, and then those countries have established democratic processes. As you went through that process, and you began to meet natives of those countries, and after the defeat of Hitler, and all, how did they respond to you and other American soldiers? Well, I was never in Japan, and I think the Japanese responded the way uh, their emperor told them to respond, regardless of their inner feelings. You could look at a, uh, the Japanese and you couldn't read what his thoughts were. The Germans were a little more um, lax in hiding their feelings, but uh, there was some Germans that uh, we just couldn't tolerate and they couldn't tolerate us even after the war. Uh, but there were some Germans, and I have met them on my trips back, um, like Fritz. He had lost one arm in the battles, and uh, yeah, we sat and drank beer together. And, uh, and then I thought then, I said, it's a shame, because had we met before the war, when if there was no war, he was the kind of a guy that would have had a, invited me in to his house for a cup of coffee. Did you meet individuals, though, that were uh, so understanding and fearful of the dictatorship of Hitler, that they were greatly relieved that he had been defeated? Very few. Hitler was a person that all the Germans uh, loved. I actually met a, um, a lady, her name was uh, Mrs. Coyle. She was with the uh, Reader's Digest, and she was invited to a dinner with Hitler before the, uh, the war. 
And she said there was about 120 people in this great hall. And Hitler arrived unannounced. and Everybody was talking as they will in the gathering. And suddenly it was just like somebody threw a lead blanket over the crowd. Everybody stopped talking at one moment. And they turned and there stood Hitler. That's what he had. So the German people um, did not hate him, no. Janelle Burke. There are many changes that have occurred since World War II. And tell us something about your equipment and the changes that have happened today, how things might be different. Well, I was one of the, as Tom Brokaw <laughs> mentioned, one of the Depression kids. And we didn't have anything, nothing but hand-me-downs. And uh, our, we didn't have refrigerators. We had an ice box. Ice was de delivered by horse and wagon, believe it or not, Model A's and so on. But anyway, when we got old enough, uh, we went into um, World War II. But the, every war brings about dramatic changes in the machinery. Uh, in other words, we went into the war with biplanes, fabric covered, 30 caliber machine guns, almost like Eddie Rickenbacker, you know. When, and, and then after the war, war ended up with jets. My God, what a transition in four years. And right after that, then we put men on the moon and back. It, uh, we went to rocket warfare, the, the V-2 rockets. The cru first cruise missile was the uh, German V-1. And so we, we made a, from horse and wagon delivering our ice to man on the moon, a lot of transition. Be I'm sorry, I'll, I know Janelle has another question. And Steve, I know we'd like to another round, and unfortunately, on this program, time just flies by with only a 30-minute <laughs> program. On behalf of Janelle Berg and Steve Schink and our staff, Donald R. Burgett, thank you so much. We certainly know and consider you a hero, as many others in World War II. And, and we, again, as we said at the beginning of the program, are honored with your presence and, and, the, and the wonderful contribution you made to democracy. And I want to also say to our viewers, again, we would encourage them to get a copy of your books well, and uh, you. read them. And good luck on the book that's coming out. Uh, we know that it, like your others, will be helpful. What's so nice about your writing of these books is that you are recording for history, when none of us are even around anymore, uh, those important facts uh, and, and uh, from a very personal note. And we thank you very much for that. Well, thank you for the opportunity and the honor of being here. I, I feel it's an honor to represent my comrades who are no longer here. Well, you have honored our program, and we thank you very much. Ladies and gentlemen, I invite you to be with us again next week. At the same time, we'll discuss you another issue. Until then, please have a good week. I am Tony Stewart. Recorded on the campus of North Idaho College, oh, Public Forum is the longest-running, entirely college-produced program on PBS. Each episode is pre-recorded live and is an educational outreach from North Idaho College. Please join us again at this same time next week for another edition of Public Forum on this public television station. <laughs>